If you can't hear me at any time, guys, just let me know, okay? Okay, this is a very interesting uh, discourse. I only printed out for us maybe three chapters of the roughly 10 chapters of this discourse. And a discourse in just, you know, in Hasidic jargon, Hasidic language, there are speeches. When a rabbi gives a speech from a pulpit, whether it's Passover or Yom Kippur, and a discourse is a very thoughtful, um, a tremendous amount of homework went into the, the Rebbe's background. And he was uh, truly went to libraries and got into a very spiritual state of meditation and so forth to get him aligned um, to discuss this Kabbalistic teaching. So it's more Kabbalistic when we talk about a discourse and let's say less on the Talmud. So in the past classes, we had classes on history or we had classes on the Talmud and so forth. But whenever you hear the terminology of a Hasidic discourse, it's generally, generally referring to Kabbalistic and esoteric worlds, which of course our job is to apply them to us and to our planet Earth. Otherwise, what's the point of just studying things of outer galaxies if it has no relevance to us? So that's a Hasidic discourse. And generally speaking, the only people that would give a Hasidic or a Kabbalistic discourse was a Hasidic Rebbe. Whether that Rebbe was the Baal Shem Tov, or whether that Rebbe was a Lubavitcher Rebbe, a Chabad Rebbe, a Satma Rebbe, or a Karlina Rebbe, Kar Karlina Rebbe. And there's a lot of Rebbe's today actually living in the world. And they come all stem from the Baal Shem Tov, who was the founder of the Hasidic movement going back 300 years. And the job of the Rebbe in many ways is to inspire a leader's flock to teach and also to emanate a lot of Kabbalistic teachings, philosophy, and so forth. So thanks, Elisa, for handling the chat room. I mean, the, the waiting room. So it happened that in 1950, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Joseph Isaac Schneerson, he was expelled from Russia in 1927 because he was spreading Judaism. And he, he was under a lot of attack by the, by, the, by the communists of that time. This was actually prior to the KGB, which came later with Stalin. And they basically wanted to stop the Lubavitch Rebbe, Joseph Isaac Schneerson, Yosef Yitzchak, from spreading Judaism. And they actually put him into prison. There's a, a book called The Heroic Struggle of his three weeks in prison. It's a very depressing, very dark uh, book based on the, the previous Rebbe's diaries of what he was doing in Russia, spreading Judaism. And then ultimately, he was sentenced to death. And eventually it was commuted from death to lifetime exile. And eventually it was commuted to just a few weeks of prison. And then he, he eventually got out and he was expelled from the country in 1927. And it happens to be that the Lubavitcher movement from 1927, once they were expelled, never looked back, never really looked back to go back and spread and develop Judaism in Russia until basically 1989, until the coup, until the Soviet Union collapsed. And it was only afterwards, maybe two years afterwards, I think maybe 1991, that the Lubavitcher Rebbe sent one of his emissaries to Russia to once again spread Judaism in Russia. We were hoping that possibly all the Jews of Russia would leave Russia and go to Israel or to America, or whatever. But many Jews stayed behind. They say around a million Jews stayed behind. And thus, the Rebbe felt it was necessary to go back into Russia and to develop it. But until then, until 1991, from 1927 to 1991, the, the Lubavitcher movement left because the Rebbe was expelled and so forth. In 1940, he, he was, I'm not going to go through all that history there, but in 1940, he, he immigrated to America. 
and in 1950, he passed away. So they actually, the previous Rebbe, they purchased 770 Eastern Parkway in 1940. His Hasidim purchased that Chabad headquarters there. And at this point, the previous Rebbe was now in a wheelchair. He was almost crippled. He couldn't speak well because of all the torture that he's been through in Russia, in the prisons and so forth. But with his hand, he was an incredible writer, an incredible, incredible writer. He wrote a tremendous amount of books. And he, through that, he was dictating and pushing the Jewish people and his Hasidim, his students, to continue the good work of spreading Judaism now, not in Russia, but now in America. And this happened from 1940 to 1950. His daughter, Chaya Mushka, married our Lubavitch Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson. So this previous Rebbe had three daughters. One daughter was killed in the Holocaust. One daughter married a, a person by the name of Reb Shimon Gamar, Shmuel Garari. And they survived and they lived in, in New York with, their, with her, her with her father and her husband. And the other third daughter was Chaya Mushka, who married the Lubavitch Rebbe. So 1950, when the previous Rebbe, Joseph Isaac Schnerson, the Rebbe of thousands of Hasidim around the world, including now in America and Brooklyn, passed away. So now you have a little bit of a scuttle between the two son-in-laws. You have the older brother-in-law, the older, excuse me, the older son-in-law of Joseph Isaac Schnerson, Shmuel Garari, he was the person who always traveled around with his father-in-law. And he was the guy that wore the black hat up and the big beard and the long black coat. And everyone assumed that he was going to be the next Rebbe. The other son-in-law, the younger one, Menachem Mendel Schnerson, our Rebbe, he was more of an academic. He actually was in college on and off for roughly 11 years. He went to college in Germany, in Berlin. He went to college in France. So our Rebbe, the, we'll just call him our Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson. Of course, he was also um, uh, very religious, very devout. Uh, you know, he, he studied Talmud, studied Kabbalah and everything else. But at the end of the day, he wore a suit. He wore a gray hat. He actually worked in 1941 for two years uh, for the military, for the Navy, actually. So uh, people weren't really looking at him. But only those that really were, were really close to him, who really understood him, who really knew him, they saw that there was something completely big and something completely large behind this facade, so to speak, of the Rebbe putting up that he's just this uh, college kid and, and so forth. Um, Zali, you have to shut off your video, Zali, or you have to... Um, Okay, so I'm happy that you're involved in the class today, Zali, but uh, not so much with Simi there, the youngest one. Okay. So in 1950, after the Rebbe, the previous Rebbe passed away, there were people that thought the older son-in-law should be the Rebbe, but basically the shift was leaning towards our Rebbe. Why? Because he was the younger one who understood the American mentality better. Although, of course, he came from Europe, but because he was a college, we can say maybe he went to university, he had a suit and tie and things like that. He went on the subway, he worked. He understood the young generation, the Americans, in a way much greater than the older son in law. In addition, the yeshiva students who were studying in the yeshiva in 770 from 1940 to 1950, they saw firsthand the Labavitcher Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who was always interactive with his yeshiva students who were 20 years old, 25 years old, 18 years old. So even while he wasn't a Rebbe, he was already developing a wonderful name for himself amongst the students of the previous Rebbe. So like we see today as well, many times it's not the people in Washington who have the power, but it's the people on the ground, the people at the universities, the people in the classrooms the people who are on the streets. And they were really the people who were pushing, including some other higher hierarchy, uh, higher individuals of the movement. And basically they were pushing for the Rebbe to be the Rebbe, for Menachem Mendel Schneerson. For 12 months, our Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, was resisting this, I don't know if I like to say coronation of being the next Rebbe, because that's more for kings and queens, but he was resisting it to his like, this is not a job for me. I will help 
Jews be Jews. I will help continuing my mission in developing Judaism in America. But a Rebbe, my father-in-law was the Rebbe and he was a very devout disciple of his father-in-law, Joseph Isaac the Rebbe. And he said, this is really not gonna happen. So there's a very interesting book by Joseph Telushkin, which he dedicates an entire chapter to this turmoil in the Lubavitch movement for 12 months from 1950 to 1951 as to who will be the next Rebbe. So it's the following year, Yudshvat, the 10th day of Shvat, and this is why we're studying this now because Yudshvat is coming up in two weeks. Our next class will already be after Yudshvat, which is the 10th day of Shvat. So I wanted to get this in now. So the 10th day of Shvat is roughly in just around two weeks. And that's the day of the passing of the sixth Rebbe, Joseph Isaac Schnerson, the guy that was expelled in 1927 from Russia, who came to America in 1940, who died now in 1950 in Brooklyn. And the following year on the first yard site, on the 10th day of Shvat, the Rebbe said, I'm going to come down to the main sanctuary and we're going to have a Farbrengen. Farbrengen is a Hasidic gathering. So word got out a few days prior that the Rebbe basically is going to accept upon himself to finally be the seventh Lubavitcher Rebbe. Even though that's not what the Rebbe said, but that's sort of what he intimated by saying, I'm going to have this Hasidic gathering in 1951 now, the following year, on the 10th day of Shvat, on the yard site of his father-in-law, of the prior Rebbe. He said, I'll be down at 9.25 p.m. He came down a little bit late, maybe a half hour later, he was speaking to his mother. Uh, at least that's what uh, the, the pundits, the, the Hasidic TMZ has it at that time, that he came down late, he was in touch with his mother of some kind. And he came down a half hour later. There were a few hundred Hasidim, disciples and students of the previous Rebbe. And of course, many people in that room were pushing for the Rebbe to be the next Rebbe. And the media, the papers is ready going out saying the Rebbe is going to declare himself to be the current Rebbe. And he started to speak Torah at this Farbringen. They're singing songs. We actually have an audio of this Farbringen, of this Hasidic gathering in, of 1951. And they're singing songs and the Rebbe is speaking and more songs and people are saying L'chaim. And it's a very, it's a very, it's, 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 it's more festive than somber. And then there was an elder fellow and is 85 years old, Rabbi Nemser or something. And he basically got up on the table and he said, we've heard your Torah. We know you're very scholarly, but we don't want Torah and scholarly speeches right now. We want a Rebbe, which means we want a new Rebbe. We want a leader. And we want you, the leader, the Rebbe, to share with us a Hasidic discourse. And I said, as I said at the beginning of the class, a Hasidic discourse is reserved only for a Rebbe. You know, Mendel Schwartz can give speeches and I can speak for hours and I can fill a bus and I can do whatever I want. But a Hasidic discourse to teach my mom to teach Hasidism, Hasidism and Kabbalah is reserved for a Rebbe. So this is what they said out the Fabringa, this 85 year old elder statesman. He said, Rebbe, Torah and Talmud we have, we want you to share a Hasidic discourse. And to that immediately the Rebbe began a Hasidic discourse. This is in 1951. There's a major hush, a major hush in the room. Everyone's quiet. And the Rebbe began his famous Hasidic discourse, which is being studied in 2021, now 70 years later. So 1951, now we're in 2021. So 70 years later, we're still pushing and studying this incredible, incredible mimer, this Hasidic discourse or this Hasidic speech that the Rebbe said in 1951 in Brooklyn on a cold, sunny, snowy night. So this Hasidic discourse became the mission statement of the Lubavitcher Rebbe and how he veered and navigated this Hasidic train which obviously has a bit of a different mission statement than the way it was in the Gulag in Russia. The mission statement was a bit different when the Jews were able to be Jews in Russia and Leningrad and Moscow in 1927, but they weren't allowed to practice certain things. They're allowed to be Jews, it wasn't Germany. 
of the 1940s. So the mission statement somewhat devolved. So now we're in 1951. So the Rebbe is making crystal clear what the mission statement is moving forward. And to a degree, that mission statement really has not changed because nothing really has changed for us, as we'll see soon what the mission statement is, as far as continuing this mission and this path of what the Rebbe started in 1951, which in short is to make the world a better place and to be kind to our fellow. So that's what we're going to do tonight and discuss this a little bit. And if I can ask maybe different people to read a paragraph, we'll see how that goes with Zoom. I know sometimes it can be tough. tough. So Sylvia, if you can begin, Sylvia Klein, with this Hasidic discourse of the Rebbe. And of course, some of this, even though it's in English, it's going to be a little bit hard to digest. And that's why I'm here to help us get through this. Okay, so you can begin, Sylvia. You can unmute yourself where it says it is evident at the very beginning on the first page, if you have it. So I'm gonna give you a minute, sure. Whoops. I hear you, yeah. Oh, you can hear me? I can hear you now, I unmuted you. Oh, okay, because it says the host is not allowing participants to unmute themselves. Okay, but now you have, okay. So, um, and you'll tell me when to stop? Yeah, just the first part. Yeah, let's see how we go. Okay. It is evident. Okay. It is evident that when the Midrash says that, quote, the essence of the Shekhinah was originally found in this lowly world, unquote, it refers to this physical world. Indeed, the Midrash goes on to explain that through the sin of the tree of knowledge, the Shekhinah departed from earth to heaven. And by giving the Torah on Mount Sinai, God returned to his garden return to his garden to his bridal chamber just as the sin itself of the tree of knowledge made possible sin in general for it precipitated and brought about the sins of Cain and Enosh as well as later sins so too with regard to the effect of sin which is the banishment of the divine presence it was the sin of the tree of knowledge that was responsible for the most significant stage in the departure of the Shefina. It's a sense specifically from this physical world. For just as the essence of the Shefina was originally found in this lowly world, i.e. in this physical world, so too the most significant stage in its departure was specifically the move from this world to heaven. And this move was brought about by the sin of the tree of knowledge. Perfect, Sylvia, thank you. You read very well. I may call upon you again soon. So first of all, Shekhinah is a feminine term for God and God dwelling. So you have masculine and feminine. I don't want to get too involved in that, but let's just say Shekhinah is the light of God's countenance. So we all know, we all study the Torah, that God created the world in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. And we use the term in the Chumash, or I should say the Torah uses its term of maybe sometimes Adonai or Elohim, different names of God. So Shekhinah is an esoteric, not a name of God, but it's the way God is manifesting himself or herself into this world. So there's God, like there's a sun, and then the sun is giving off light or the sun is giving off heat so the shekhinah is this light this very essence this very godly light and coming down to planet earth so the same way god made a solar system and he made stars and he made suns and moons and oceans and trees in order for all that to exist according to kabbalah we do not say that god created the world and then he left and the world continues to exist on its own. No, we say that God infuses himself into planet earth because this is his home. This is what he made. So that's the Shekhinah that's coming down to planet earth. 
Now, before the sin of Adam and Eve, this Shekhinah was very much at home because the world was a perfect place. People weren't embarrassed of each other. There was no evil inc inclinations. As we know, Adam and Eve walked naked with no clothes. There was no, uh, you know, no, no one was sinning then. So the Shekhinah was here in full, in full throttle. Once there was the sin of Adam and Eve, so the Kabbalah tells us that the Shekhinah was removed slightly from planet Earth and it moved up. Let's say we'll call it heaven one. We say the seven heavens, you know? So this is heaven one. After another sin of Cain and Enosh or Cain and Abel, then the Shekhinah moved up to the second heaven, removing himself further from planet earth, further from us. And when there was another sin of, let's say, Lot or Sodom and Amorah, then the Shekhinah removed himself even more to heaven four and heaven five. So this is not a novelty from the Lubavitcher Rebbe in 1951. This is basic teachings in the Kabbalah about the Shekhinah coming down. And through the sins, the Shekhinah goes up, it ascends. The novelty of what the Rebbe is telling us here is that the main uh, fault, the main, the, the greatest revolution when we talk about the Shekhinah removing himself and going higher and higher and higher into the heavens and removing himself from planet Earth, the greatest catastrophe was when God removed himself from planet Earth and went up to heaven one. The catastrophe isn't the six heavens. The catastrophe is when God removed himself from planet Earth to, the, to heaven one. Because what do we care most about? When God's from the heaven three or to heaven four, that's almost irrelevant to me. I really know what heaven three or heaven four looks like. It's all esoteric. What's relevant to me is when the Shekhinah is here on planet Earth. And now God removes himself. And as a result of God removing himself and there's this spiritual darkness in planet Earth. Now Adam and Eve are embarrassed from each other. And now they're running to get clothing. And now there's room for more sin. So the first sin was the greatest catastrophe of Adam and Eve. And the first ascent of the Shekhinah from planet Earth to the first heaven was also the greatest catastrophe. Okay. Continue, Sylvia. You know, you read very nice. If you don't mind reading one another one. This also explains. Oh, do I have to, I have to unmute you? Okay, give me a minute. Give me a minute. Okay, I just asked to unmute you. Go ahead. Okay. This also explains, yeah. All right. This also explains why the Rebbe of blessed memory does not include the sin of the tree of knowledge together with the other sins. That I just want to interrupt you. This, this discourse, the Rebbe is saying, this is, why, this is also why the Rebbe of blessed memory, this is the Rebbe speaking in 1951, referring to the previous Rebbe. This oh, also okay. explains why the Rebbe of blessed, blessed memory does not include in his Kabbalistic discourses. Continue. Okay. Um, where am I? Okay, well, I'll start. This also explains why the, the Rebbe of blessed memory does not include the sin of the tree of knowledge together with the other sins that cause the further departure of the Shekhinah, but lists it separately. For the sins of Cain and Enosh, as well as the later sins, cause the Shekhinah to depart from one heaven to the next, whereas the sin of the tree of knowledge caused its departure from earth to heaven. Right, Apart right. from, oh, sorry? No, I, I'm, I'm sorry. We, you're just uh, stating what I just said. I'm sorry, let me to cut you off. But I was just oh. saying like, that's right. Continue. Oh, yeah. okay. Apart from the fact that this stage in the distancing of the divine is the one that most affects us in this world, this stage is also objectively the most significant. The Rebbe of Blessed Memory continues his discourse by quoting the conclusion of the Midrash. Thereafter, seven Sadakim arose whose divine service drew the divine present down once more into this world below. Through the merit of Avraham, the Shekhinah was brought down from seventh heaven to the sixth. And after abridging the continuation of the Midrash, the Rebbe concludes, until Moshe, the seventh of these Sarakim and all those who are seventh are cherished. Drew the revelation from the Shekhinah down once again into this world below. 
The main step in the drawing down of the Shekhinah was thus taken by Moshe, for it was he who returned the Shekhinah to this world. Just as the principal stage in its withdrawal and ascent was the departure from this world caused by the sin of the tree of knowledge, so too the principal stage in the descent and return of the Shekhinah was accomplished when it was drawn down into this world. Apart from the fact that this stage in the drawing down of the divine is, one, is the one that most affects us in this world, this stage is also objectively the most significant. And it was specifically through Moshe that the Shekhinah was drawn down. The reason being, as explained parenthetically in the Ma'amar, the Ma'amar is, is a Hebrew word, is a Hebrew word for discourse. Oh, okay. Um, that all of those who are seventh are cherished. So all the Rebbe is saying over here is just like we were speaking about the Shekhinah being removed from planet Earth and going higher and higher and higher through the result of different sins of various different generations. So too, you had a situation through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, uh, different leaders through their great merit and through their harmony and unity and doing good for the world. The Shekhinah, this godly manifestation, came back down from heaven seven to six to five to four until finally down to planet Earth through, which was the final one, Moses, as it says, he was the seventh and cherished. He was the one through Mount Sinai, through the, ten, uh, the, the splitting of the Red Sea, ultimately to Mount Sinai. He brought the Torah to humanity. And that's where God Shekhinah was once again infused in planet Earth. And there was a synthesis between physicality and spirituality in such a beautiful way that Mo what Moses did, um, just like almost prior to Adam and Eve sinning. That's how powerful the Shekhinah was in planet Earth. And again, this was done through various different Jewish leaders, but concluding with Moses, the seventh one. Um, let's continue. Chapter three. Lisa, you want to read? Sure. Uh, let's see. It's on the second page, the fact that our sages say. All right, I'm with you. The fact that our sages say that all those who are seventh are cherished rather than all those who are cherished are seventh indicates that the seventh primary quality lies in his being seventh. In other words, he is cherished not on account of his choice, desire, or spiritual service, but because he is seventh. And this is something that he is born into. Yet the fact remains that all who are seventh are cherished. It was for this reason that it was Moshe who was privileged to have given, to have the Torah given through him. The Rebbe of Blessed Memory explained soon after arriving in America, that even when we refer to the seventh of a series as being the most cherished, the special quality of the first is apparent for the whole meaning of the seventh is seventh from the first. Okay, so let me explain. So the Rebbe is, um giving a, a nuance detail here when it says the term in quotes all those who are seventh are cherished which is something that we see in kabbalah and we see this in talmud as well all those who are seventh are cherished and that's why the talmud tells us moses was the guy to bring the shekhinah down to planet earth through mount sinai and everything else and i quote all those who are seventh are cherished and moses was a seventh from abraham but the rebbe says it's interesting to note he says this in 1951 that it does not say all those who are cherished are seventh. It does not say all those who are cherished are seventh. Rather, all those who are seventh are cherished. What's the difference? Because Moses didn't do anything on his own to merit the Shekhinah coming down to planet Earth. Rather, he was simply at the right place at the right time. He was seventh in line. All those who are seventh are going to be cherished because they're seventh in line. So in other words, if he was, let's say, in the third generation, he wouldn't have brought the Shekhinah down to planet Earth. It was lucky him because he was seventh in line. That's why he is cherished. Now we must make note 
that he is a seventh from who? He's a seventh from Abraham. So whenever you say the words, Moses, you're the seventh and you're the most cherished, we're saying two things. One is because you are number seven, that's why you are cherished. Again, you're simply at the right place at the right time. And number two, let's look a little bit. Who are your seventh? Your seventh to whom? Your seventh from the first guy. Who is the first guy? Abraham. Let's speak a little bit about Abraham. Yes, yes, Stephen. Yes, we're going to get to that minute. He was number seven. Yes. So we're just making a little nuance of a note over here that it's important to realize what Rebbe is slamming home this principle that all those who are seventh are cherished. Let me continue. I'm going to continue to read. The Rebbe then explained the qualities that the first of our forefather Abraham attained through his spiritual service, which was performed with self-sacrifice and devotion with Mesiras Nefesh, which in Hebrew means self-sacrifice. As we know, Abraham went on self-sacrifice. Not content with the above, the Rebbe adds, though this is seemingly not relevant to a central theme, that Abraham did not actively pursue Messiah. So he didn't pursue to go on self-sacrifice. Like he didn't want to go up and fight against the five kings because he was looking to make trouble. He didn't want to go to Sodom and save them and go up against God and all these other stories. He didn't want to sacrifice his son Isaac because he had a, a, a slow day. He didn't want to jump into the fiery furnace because we know the story with Nimrod trying to throw these people in the first before furnace because they were doing idol worship and so forth. He wasn't pursuing self-sacrifice. He just did it because that's what needed to be done at the time. In this, his service was unlike that of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was the great sage who was living under the Roman Empire, think around um, 200 BCE, around 150 years, give or take, after the destruction of the sec Second Temple. They were under the regime of the Romans. So in this, his service was unlike that of Rabbi Akiva, who did actively seek. And Rabbi Akiva, he was, we know that he was saying, quote, when will I be afforded the opportunity for self-sacrifice so that I may actualize it? Because one of the mitzvahs is, if necessary, go on Mesirat Nefesh, go on self-sacrifice. We know it says in the Shema Yisrael, right? You should, have you should love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your might. So Rabbi Kiva's like, I'm waiting for the day. Let me have it. And he's, and he's looking to try to figure out how he can go on self-sacrifice. Avraham's Mesirat Nefesh, by contrast, Abraham's self-sacrifice, by contrast, was incidental to his actual service. So you can have two great leaders who are going to go on self-sacrifice, but there's two different ways how they're approaching it. To Abraham, he knew that the main object of divine service was that defined by the sage's interpretation of the verse, he proclaimed there the name of God, Lord, the Lord of the world. Do not read by Yikra, do not read that he proclaimed, that Abraham proclaimed, but rather he made others proclaim. Abraham wasn't interested in his self-service. He wanted others to proclaim that there is a God, i.e., let another man likewise proclaim God's name. Let me just continue reading a little bit, then we'll kind of backtrack. And if in the course of this service, self-sacrifice was called for, then he could supply that too. But he wasn't totally invested in himself like Rabbi Kiva. I want to fulfill my next mitzvah of going self-sacrifice. He was more concerned with other Jews proclaiming God and being Jewish. Indeed, so estimable was Abraham's divine service and self-sacrifice that even Moses was privileged to have the Torah given through him because he was the beloved seventh, because he was seventh to Abraham. Because he's not seventh to uh, John Shmo, then what makes you cherished? You're not se you're seventh to whom? But that's what made Moses great because he was seventh. We all know seventh are cherished. He was seventh to Abraham, this great guy, the seventh to the first. It is to this relationship between them that the sages apply the verse. God told Moses, do not stand in the place of the greats. He's telling Moses, don't try to stand in the place of Abraham. You're not, you're not going to fill up his shoes. Abraham's Abraham. It is true that the seventh of a series is very much loved. And that this status comes not as a result of choice, nor as a result of one's divine service. 
like how great Moses is. It's not about that. But as a finished product, merely as a result of birth, Moses was born, like I said, at the right time, at the right place, as the seventh leader. So that's it. Nevertheless, there are no inherent limitations that should cause an individual to say that this status is beyond him and that, is it, and that it is accessible only to a select few, like to the Moseses. On the contrary, this is a situation similar to that which is explained in the Tanya, Tana, excuse me, in a book, Tana de Veolio, as quoted in Chasidus, that every Jew, even a slave and handmaiden, can attain the inspiration of divine spirit. Similarly, each and every Jew is obligated to say, when will my actions equal those of my forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, etc.? At the time, we should not dilute, dilute ourselves. We must know that we should not stand in the place of the greats. Don't think you're going to be like an Abraham. And that the merit of the seventh of a series consists of his being seventh to the first, i.e., he or she is capable of doing the divine service and fulfilling the mission of the first. Do not read, he proclaimed, but rather, I made others complain. That's our job. This, then, is why the seventh is so cherished. It is he who draws down the Shekhinah, in fact, the essence of the Shekhinah. Moreover, he draws it down into the lowly world. It is this that is demanded of each and every one of us of the seventh generation. Now the Rebbe Sal takes a turn and he says, it is demanded of us, we are the seventh generation. Until now, we're speaking about Abraham and Moses. Now it's thousands of years later, it's 1951, and the Rebbe takes a little bit of a turn and he says, we are the seventh generation. I'm going to address that in a moment. And all those that are seventh are cherished. Although the fact, I'm like eight lines from the bottom, although the fact that we are in the seventh generation is not the result of our own choosing and our own service, we never chose to be the seventh generation. And indeed, in certain ways, perhaps contrary to our will, many people rather not deal with this. We rather lived 200 years ago. Nevertheless, all those who are seventh are cherished. We are now very near the approaching footsteps of the Mashiach. Indeed, we are at the conclusion of this period, and our spiritual task is to complete the process of drawing down the Shekhinah, moreover, the essence of the Shekhinah, within specifically our lowly world down here. So, just to backtrack a little bit, the Balatanya, the author of the Tanya, was the first Labavitch Rabbi. He had a son, Dovir, who was the second Labavitch Rebbe. I'm going now back 250 years. The third Labavitch Rebbe was at Semach Tzedek, who was the grandson of the, of the, of the first Rebbe. Joseph Isaac Schnerson that we spoke about that was expelled in 1927 was the sixth Labavitch Rebbe. His son-in-law, Menachem Mendel Schnerson, our Rebbe, was the seventh Labavitch Rebbe. I don't know if anyone was expecting this in the room in 1951. They were just hoping he was going to be and say he'll be the next Rebbe and he's going to lead the Jewish community. But the Rebbe actually took it a step further. And he said, we are the seventh generation. He didn't say like right away on himself. But he said, we, collectively, we are the seventh generation. So he's saying the Hasidic discourse, that's intimating that he's their next Rebbe. Because you can't be a Rebbe and say the Hasidic discourse. So he's the Rebbe. So at the beginning of the Mimer, the beginning of the discourse, whenever there's a hush in the room, everyone knows, congratulations, he's the next Rebbe. And then the Rebbe is going through his Hasidic discourse, speaking about these very esoteric things, and basically takes his turn and he says, everybody, we are the seventh generation. And he's saying, even though you may not want to be the seventh generation, because you were born by default in this generation, and you never signed up for the job, but the very fact that you are seven means you are cherished. And you are the seventh to the first. So we have a big job to do. And then the next chapter, which is the last page, he has a call to action. I'm going to read it if you don't mind, okay? This, could, this, this goes on for another two hours or so, but obviously this is the bridge version. So this is on the fourth and final page over here. I just sort of condensed it. So what's the call to action? What did the Rebbe say? Okay, so we're the seventh generation. So now what should we do? Should we go to Equinox and LA Fitness and make sure everyone loses 40 pounds? What, what, what's our mission here? So says the Rebbe, we must understand 
the Rabbi continued, that, that our preciousness as a seventh generation and our capacity to consummate the process of making this world into a divine abode is due to the fact that we perpetuate the mission embarked upon by the first, the conduct of the first Rebbe of Chabad, of Lubavitch, Rabbi Schneir Zaman of Liadi. He was the master, the first Lubavitch Rebbe, and he was similar to Abraham, being the first of the, of the leaders. Now, again, this is very important to the Rebbe because going back to the beginning of the discourse, when we're talking about the Shechina, where is the Shechina right now? Is it in, in, the, in the third heaven, in the fourth heaven? So the Rebbe felt, just like the generation prior to Moses, the Shechina was in the sixth, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the first heaven. It was stuck. It was after six generations from Abraham, Moses, his job was to bring it down to planet Earth, to bring the Shechina down to planet Earth through Mount Sinai and everything else. But until it comes down to planet Earth and it remains in heaven number one, then the job is incomplete. I don't care that there was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and everybody else. But if the Shechina, this, this emanation of godliness, is stuck somewhere in the higher galaxy system, what help is it to me? So Moses is the hero because he brought it down to planet Earth. When I say Moses is the hero, says the Rebbe, he's the hero in the sense that he's the seventh guy. So he's the seventh guy. He's cherished because he's, he's, he's the seventh leader. But we're so thankful because he brought it down to planet Earth because that's the main job. Anything less than that is no good. It's like the sprinter doing the, hunt, the uh, a thousand meter dash and, he, and he, he, he finished, he short one meter. And he was winning the whole time against a hundred other racers. No one says he was the best until the last meter. No one cares. The job wasn't complete. The job was only complete when the Shekhinah, this Godliness comes down to planet Earth, which was done once through Moses. But now we got to do it again through the next round. And Shnerzaman of Liadi a few hundred years ago at the founding of the Hasidic Lubavitcher movement was, was generation number one. And now we are generation seven. So he sought nothing for himself, this Shnerzaman, this first Rebbe. He didn't even want Messir Nefesh like Abraham of self-sacrifice, for he knew that his whole existence was for the sake of proclaiming the name of God, proclaiming and causing others to proclaim, just like Abraham was doing. In the spirit of Abraham, this means arriving in places where there is nothing, where nothing is known to godliness, nothing is known of Judaism, nothing is known even of the Aleph phase, which means a Jew doesn't know the difference between an Aleph and a Bet. And while there, setting oneself completely aside and devoting oneself to the mission at hand, to make others proclaim that there is a God. For me to sit in Brooklyn and to study the whole day and say that I believe in God, big deal. That's what my parents trained me to do. For me to uh, light Shabbat candles and keep Shabbat on my level is a beautiful thing, but big deal if there's another Jew that doesn't know about Shabbat, so it's upon us not just to proclaim that there's a God, but to make others proclaim that there is a God. This is where the Rebbe is going. And by the way, 1951, you hear it on the audio when he said these words that another Jew doesn't know the difference between an Aleph and a Bed, he was actually crying. This pained him that he's in Brooklyn in 1951. Thank God he survived the Holocaust and everything else, but there were Jews that didn't know anything. They're running the other way. And let it be known, if a person wishes to succeed in his or her own proclamation, i.e. their own divine service to God, then he must see to it that others too, even those who have here that been utterly ignorant, know and vociferously, what a nice English word there, proclaim that there is a God. Anything less than that, then you're, 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 you're losing out in your relationship. So to conclude with the Rebbe's words, it is this that is demanded of each and every one of us of the seventh of the seventh every one of us of the seventh generation, generation for all those that are seventh are cherished. And although the fact that we are in the seventh generation is not the result of our own choosing and our own service, and indeed in certain ways, perhaps contrary to our will. Nevertheless, all those who are seventh are cherished. So we are now very near the approaching of footsteps of Mashiach. Indeed, we're in the conclusion of the spirit, our spiritual tasks to complete the process, drawing down to the the essence of the Shekinah, specifically within our own lowly world. Now, it was this very Hasidic discourse, no doubt, that made the Lubavitch movement strong around the world today, and it would have never happened 
if not that two hour discussion and Hasidic discourse in 1951. Because basically the, what the Rebbe was saying is don't tell me you're a religious Jew when you know of other Jews who don't know an Aleph from a Bet and are not practicing and you're going to wipe your hands clean. You must go out from your comfort zone and make others proclaim God, make others put on the mezuzah, make others put on tefillin, others light the Shabbat candles and so on and so forth. That was the job of the seventh generation of the Rebbe's generation. The previous Labavitch Rebbe, the sixth generation, I had to say the mission of that generation was survival, was simply to survive in such a horrible time. Where we, we can't imagine what the Hasidic Rebbe's during the 1920s and 1930s, the 1940s, especially in Germany, we, we can't even fathom what they had to deal with. So obviously they have a tremendous mission. And I believe the mission was simply just to survive, you know, amongst other missions, let's just say. But now in America, the golden state, the golden country, and people are getting jobs, people are able to work in the workplace, in the workforce. Uh, we have this free country. The Rebbe called America the country of kindness. Medinat Shal Chesed. We're able to really get what we want. I sort of laugh uh, the last uh, two years, especially with people uh, speaking to me about the media, about us not being able to have our rights and uh, we don't get to do this. We have no independence anymore because the governments, whether eat either side of the, the aisle you're on, you know. And I sort of laugh because I'm looking at what once upon a time, what it meant not to have rights, whether it's in Russia in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. So today we have a lot of rights, even though maybe things are not perfect and, you know, nothing's ever perfect, but we have a lot of rights today. And the Rebbe basically told everyone, whether you like it or not, we are the seventh generation because we're the seventh from the first and the seventh is cherished. So even if you're not up to the mission, but that's, that's where we're, we're, we're in this, we're stuck in this together. And what's the mission like Abraham was doing to go on Mesirat Nefesh, to go on self-sacrifice and wherever necessary, try to get other people and Jewish people to have a relationship with God. And that mission statement really has not changed. That's why I said at the very beginning, even though it's only 70 years, it's, it has been already 70 years. And that's a long time. And uh, most corporations probably will find a new mission statement after 70 years. But in this sense, it has not changed. As long as Mashiach has not come yet, and as long as there's another Jew, whether they're stuck in Ojai, California, or Santa Barbara, or Tucson, Arizona, or Bangkok, Thailand, Australia, San Bernardino, Los Angeles, Chino, Ontario, if there's Jews anywhere, then it, it's, it's on us to, uh, to, to continue the fight, uh, as it were, and we're still in the seventh generation. We have not had a new Rebbe, so we're not like converting to an eighth generation. We're still in the seventh generation. I'll beat a long seventh generation, but uh, that mission uh, still stands, and we still got work to do. So I'll leave, the, leave it at that. And I will uh, stop the class. Anyone that has questions, you're more than welcome.